Let's not talk about what you want to do. Let's talk about where you want to be. And I pretty much immediately said, if I could live in any one place, I would choose to live in Santa Fe. And then, you know, sort of whatever happened, we had a conversation went on from there. Didn't think much more about it until the next day you said, how would you like to run my Santa Fe gallery? Oh my. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have, this is kind of going to be a fun interview in, a, in an interesting way, because probably of all the people I've interviewed, I think I have probably known you as well as anyone, Yeah, in I, at least some ways. We've known each other for, I don't know, 20 oh, years. About 20 years, yeah, yeah, exactly. And you work for me, uh -huh. so, but it never fails me <laughs> <laughs> that I'll find out things I didn't, and also even when you work for somebody. Um, you don't, you know, you don't sit down and do this as much. No, Usually, right. you know, a, you do shop talk or whatever. Yeah, it's a or different kind of relationship. It's a different kind of relationship. And you've been on your own for quite a while and lots of cool things have happened. So I'm going to just kind of start from the beginning okay. and find out. I know, I know you grew up in Minnesota, that for yeah. sure. Yeah, Minnesota. In fact, that was a hiring plus when I was hiring. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's from Minnesota. I like that. So he must be nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So w w did you, were you born and raised, I'm assuming, in Minnesota? Uh, no, no, actually, I was born in Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh. So kind of the same thing. Yeah, it is kind of uh, the same thing, actually. And uh, I was three when my family moved to Minnesota. My father was a clergyman. Yes. And so, and they tend to move around from time to time. Um, but my father mostly uh, like small churches in kind of rural-ish places, except uh -huh. for his last one, which was in suburban Detroit. Oh, that's a big one. So when I was 12, yeah, we moved to, to Michigan. And Detroit? Well, uh, a town called Allen Park, which is just south of Detroit, oh, yeah, so next was... to Dearborn, Henry Ford's territory, which is a much more famous place. Yeah. So you're this uh, <clears throat> kind of growing up in rural area. Your dad, your father's a, a preacher. And, what do you call him, minister or preacher? Does it uh, matter? Minister, preacher, clergyman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Holy roller. Pastor. Not that. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> Holy roller. I don't know. <laughs> a little on the conservative side, yeah. but um, but no, it's a pretty much mainstream. Uh, uh, we're ethnic Dutch and Frisian, and, so, and he was a, a pastor in the, what's called the Reformed Church in America. Right. Okay, I've heard of that, actually. Yeah. And so when you're growing up, do you have an innate uh, interest in art right off the crack? I, you know, I guess so. Um, my, my father uh, was always interested in art, and he dabbled a little bit. Like painting? Um, a little bit of painting. Um, when he was younger and then, then when he retired, we have uh, in our family a few copies of two etchings that my dad made when he was in college, which oh, yeah. we treasure very much, and they're, they're beautiful little etchings. Was he an um, art major in college? Uh, yeah. No, he, he always had in mind from a small child to, to become a clergyman. Hmm. So, um, you know, actually, I'm not sure what his major in college was, but he went right from college to, to divinity school. Right. So he did some, and then so were you painting or drawing or doing any of that kind of stuff? Or? No, I, I did uh, a little bit here and there, also dabbled, some in school and some on my own, um, but um, didn't have the drive to, to, to do it myself. Mm -hmm. I was very happy to, uh, to just observe what far more skilled people were right. able to do. Right, right. And you, now, where do you fall in the line? Because you've got some siblings. Yeah, I'm the fourth of five. Yes, you're the fourth of five. And so when you're growing up, and you grow, when do you graduate from high school, just so I get a Seven, sense? 74. 74. Mm -hmm. huh. Wow, you look really good. You're, you're, <laughs> Thank you. You're older than me. I never <laughs> yes. even knew that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. No, you didn't. <laughs> didn't oh, matter. Okay. I didn't no, care right. what your age was, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you graduate in 74, mm -hmm. and you also, that formative years, when you're a teenager, you're uh, in the suburbs of Detroit? Yeah, so I was, I was 12 when we moved to, to Michigan, but um, my parents are both from Chicago, mm. and so we would, every year, no matter where we were living, um, we would go to visit relatives in Chicago, both, both parents' families. And uh, part of those annual trips was always going to the museums. Hmm. So we would go to the Museum of Science and Industry, to the Chicago Art Institute, to, you know, to wherever. Um, and in other cities as well. So uh, museum going was just sort of something we all grew up with and continued to do. And um, when we moved to Michigan, um, I mentioned Dearborn, it's kind of the next town over. 
um, was the home of Henry Ford, and now Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Villager. Now it's mm-hmm. just called the Henry Ford. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was something that, we, you know, relatives, visitors would come to town, and we'd just take them to Greenfield Village. That's what we right. did. And I always loved the place. And so um, when I turned 16, uh, I went there and applied for a job and was a groundskeeper at Greenfield Village uh-huh. until high school. Or th- through two years of high school, I should say. And then when I turned 18, I became a docent. Ah. And that was my college job. So you clearly love that museum. So I did. What was it I about that do. museum? And what's in it? I've never been in it. Well, it's basically a technology museum. Uh-huh. Um, so, of course, it's famous for its automobile collection and, and other transportation things. But... Um, uh, I was uh, a decorative arts curator there eventually. So furniture, silver ceramics, glass, that sort of thing. Um, There's a big textile collection, uh, enormous communications collection. I was also in charge of lighting um, and and an enormous collection of agricultural equipment. Yeah, and so you those are the main collections. And you did this for four years? And I did, I was a a guide, we were called guides. I was a docent there for four years. And worked through college. Well, actually, three years because I spent my junior year abroad. But but yeah, so for three years and then went to graduate school in the East at at Winterthur. We won't let you get there that far. I'm still still back. You're still back in Michigan. I'm still back at this museum. uh, I want want to know what the greatest (laughs) thing is in that museum. Oh, right, right. You you were a curator there for really three years. What's the one piece that everybody... For docent there for three years. Um, The the part that that fascinated me the most was kind of the the home interiors. Uh, And the... Because it was, uh, you know, places like Science and Industry or the Art Institute, you, you know, it's mostly about individual objects or, or in the case of Science and Industry, kind of more processes and things. But, but Greenfield Village caught my imagination because of the recreation. And it turned out not terribly accurate recreations at the time, but uh-huh. we, we fixed that to some degree. Uh, but it, it, just recreations of, of domestic spaces and, and, you know, the implements of kind of daily life. And that's what always fascinated me. And that me. was kind of like through the times, like 1900, 1920 yeah, the, kind of thing? Yeah, the, 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 the stuff that Henry Ford collected mostly dated from um, the 1820s to about the turn of the 20th century. Oh, yeah. So you weren't yeah, really... That was the core of it. Yeah. So I was, I was always kind of interested in Victorian in 19th century American yeah. history and Victorian culture. And the, and the history was the part of that you think you like the most because of that? Yes. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. So I, I got into art a little later. Um, and Henry Ford was, no, well, you know, for those who studied him, he was notorious for um, not being at all interested in art. Mm-hmm. He just, it just didn't make any sense, sense to him. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't understand it. Didn't, didn't care for it that much. So the, the collections that Henry Ford, um, have very very little art and it's mostly what they do have it's mostly stuff that was purchased by the people who then ran the place in the 1960s 70s i see so really he what he was interested in was it was technology and getting wealthy well that too yeah it's, <laughs> <laughs> and he did both. and he he was very successful yeah. and, and making a really good truck of course he of course he was making yeah long after his time yeah. but but no, his son Edsel made a pretty good Model A. He yeah. made a pretty good Model T. Yeah, so. Maynard Dixon just thought the Model T was just the scourge of the earth. He really it, did. It was in many ways. Yeah, I mean, it, just opened right. it up to everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. He, Suburbanized he, he, America. Yeah, yeah, he was not a fan. <laughs> no, I'm sure. <laughs> so what did you uh, study in college? What was your, um, what did you think you were going to be? Clearly not a preacher, I would say. <clears throat> no, that that was never on the, on the, on agenda. the agenda. <clears throat> but your father probably would have been loved loved that. I'm sure are. he I'm sure he would have. But, yeah. yeah, but no, his five kids, uh, none of his five kids became preachers. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, no, so I uh, so when I turned I mentioned when I turned 18, I became a docent, and then uh, and then uh, through that experience uh, at at Henry Ford Museum, particularly Greenfield Village, part of it. Um, I decided I wanted to go into museum work. Yeah. And that was it. And so, you know, I had a few friends who felt, who I worked with who felt the same way. And we sought out graduate programs in, in museum work. Um, uh, my friends all ended up going to University of Michigan for graduate school. I ended up going to Winterthur. Um, and but you I took just, a year off and went on abroad? 
That when I was a junior, I spent I did the junior abroad. Yeah, where'd thing, you go? Uh, to the Netherlands, to Utrecht. Ah, and was that to go home to see the home folk? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how did that open you up or change you, or did it? Um, not a great deal. No. Um, you know, I, I uh, probably the most important thing was just sort of being on my own in a strange mm-hmm. environment and sort of learning to, to, you know, deal with that kind of be self sufficient and You're like figure stuff out. Nineteen twenty. So yeah, probably yeah, probably nineteen. Yeah. yeah, and the and the Vietnam War has already kind of closed down, so you don't have to deal with this at all. Yeah, so uh, that would have been seventy six, seventy seven. I was over there. Yeah, right. and you graduate in seventy seventy eight. Yeah, so yeah, you didn't yep. have to worry about that kind of stuff. So you come back from that, and you graduate, and then you go to Winterthur, and then I go to Winterthur immediately. Winterthur. So yeah, yeah and tell people a little bit about that because it's a very interesting place. It is. It's it's a pretty remarkable place. I mean, in a, in a very different way than Henry Ford Museum is a remarkable place. But it's uh, it's an enormous collection of early American decorative arts. So, seventeenth, uh, eighteenth, and early nineteenth century, uh, put together by uh, a scion of the of the Dupont family, mm-hmm. Henry Francis Dupont. Um, uh, Winter Tour refers to the city in Switzerland where the where the area of Switzerland where the Duponts are some of the some of the family was mm-hmm. from. Although Duponts came from France uh, to the United States, um, uh, and uh, it's they I can't remember when it started. Fifty two maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, Dupont started a, a, a master's program um, in American. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember yeah. what the <laughs> official name of the program is. That's okay. After all, wing these it. Years, nobody will know. Yeah, basically Except a, a program in American ma- material culture right. studies and material culture studies. Unfortunately, has kind of disappeared off the academic map. It was of great interest to me. Um, and what does that mean exactly? Well, it it means understanding culture through objects, I see. both how people especially how people use objects, but to a certain degree how people make objects. But it's, um, so, you know, culture is composed of kind of all of the patterns of thinking and acting that a group of people do that put that makes them, in, you know, have something in mm-hmm. common. And so, you know, we're, we're used to understanding music and how music is shared or, or literature or storytelling. Mm-hmm. You know, those are all aspects of culture. But the the way we make and use objects also has yeah, similar patterns and so so it was even focused if it's on, iphones even if it's iphones right. exactly i mean all all things and so and of course technology is a very important part of that um in both how we make and use objects and so um so there was when i was at winter in the 70s and early 80s um there was that field was kind of emerging and there were several academics who uh, we're really trying to push it forward and and create um, you know a, a, a theories essentially of of how this stuff worked. Um, one group of those people got really interested in structuralism, which I think is probably totally dead now. But mm. I don't I don't follow it anymore. Oh, but there, well, there were different aspects. So much were, for his life. Right. There were right. There were exactly. Uh, there were some that were more sociologically oriented. There were some that are kind of more art oriented. Uh-huh. Um, but it was very interesting because it was an intersection of all those things of, how's of that, how's art, that, anthropology, history, yeah, sociology. I was say, how does that differ from anthropology? Um, it, it it's very it, it, of all of the disciplines. It's probably most closely related to anthropology mm-hmm. and history. The way it was forming then, in mm-hmm. circa nineteen eighty, um, and but it's but it it um, it took a much broader look, or the people who involved, you know, wanted to to take a much broader mm-hmm. look and, and really the kind of the intersection of all these different fields. Um, so that's what you got your master's. So in that's that what I got my master's degree in. And then I, I was, uh, uh, when I was there or the year, I guess, yeah, I, there was one year in between master's and PhD program. And I guess it was that year that that winter to started a PhD program and they asked me to come back and go into the PhD program. And it wasn't, it wasn't something I was planning to do, but I guess I was kind of flattered sure. <laughs> by the invitation, yeah. and I did. And both the both the MA and the PhD programs there are are fellowship programs, so it's basically a free ride. Um, so that didn't hurt either. Yeah. Um, and and it was and it was great. Um, but I learned 
um, over the course of doing the PhD studies that um, I was not at all interested in academia. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was petty and vicious, frankly. Because <laughs> um, you could see the politics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, well, well, there's an old saying, but the... Uh, uh, something like academic politics are so vicious because there's so little at stake. <laughs> <laughs> and you could feel that. Yeah. 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 So, so I, it was just, you know, some people are great at it. They can, it was not, it yeah. was not for me. Yeah. You, you had to play me. the game. So I kind of, right. So I kind of retreated back to, to Henry Ford Museum in Grufu Village and then became a curator of domestic life, as I mentioned. I, I was in, responsible for what? Furniture, silver ceramics, lighting, clocks, um, glass. So you decided what? not to finish that. So I, yeah, you, I you didn't, didn't I just enough. kind of Did you do it. a couple years there? Yeah, I, and it was great. I, and I had a two-year fellowship at the Smithsonian uh, Na National Museum of American History. And that on, was great. So I had a wonderful the, experience. On top of the two years, at, uh, the other two years on one and third? Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And what did you do at the Smithsonian? Um, well, ostensibly, I was writing my dissertation. And I, I see. I wrote about half of it. Uh -huh. uh, and what was uh, your dissertation? The half you finished. What was it on? Well, it was it was about um, it was about the relationship between technology and fashion in the furniture industry. Uh, so um, interesting, actually. So yeah, I, was, I thought it was still pretty, is still it was would pretty be. interesting. Um, so the see if I can recreate the basic idea. It's been so long that. Um, uh, uh. This is what we call dead air. For yeah, this is dead that, air. I no, I can't this. recreate it. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> you want to you wanna call a friend? <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to call a friend. Um, anyway, so you, you work on that at the Smithsonian for two years. For two years, and you yeah. Got, and you had access to, to it, all the It was material. fantastic because, yeah, because if, you know, connected with... A government agency and you've just sort of, sort of got entree to all kinds of things and, and so was, would you go kind of zip around and look at different things oh or? yeah it was it was fabulous well, well, you go to go to lectures and and go to shows and and uh you know spent days in the museum and there were always kind of seminars going on and brown bag lunch talks and yeah. i mean it was just constant it, it was just constant activity it, um, and you didn't so go was, maybe i should just stay here and do something no because um because it was also very clear to me uh, that uh, the people who worked at the Smithsonian, um, what's the what's the what's the nice way to say this? Yes, it yeah. was the political issue again. Is that yeah. is that they? It was highly it, structured. It, took, it was well, it, it was it was so highly structured that it was grotesquely inefficient. Yeah, uh, and so it took you know people would would fight to get these big projects on the agenda, wonderful things, great ideas. Right. And, it, and it just took forever. And they spent vast amounts of money and many years doing this stuff. And they were just, just kind of hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. It's the government. It's the government. Yeah. And so I, I just realized, no, I'm yeah, not going to do, do this. Did you see native arts or Western art at that time? Had you? No. So you had yet to really explore that, or Ex exactly. Yeah. I had very little exposure to Western yeah. art at that point. Yeah, you knew what a and, French terrain looked like, but you couldn't yeah, tell you right. what a Pueblo pot was and, at that point. Yeah, it, no, exactly. And you know, my my experience with native stuff consisted primarily of having grown up near Pipestone, Minnesota, mm. near Pipestone National Monument. Right. And so I was somewhat acquainted with with plains, northern plains material, but only very superficially. So you go I'd get a job at, at the Henry Ford Museum, and this time you're not a docent. Now you're actually the curator. Right. See, I got it right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and how long are you the curator at Henry Ford? So I was there. Uh, well, I went through a succession of jobs at Henry Ford. So I started out as a domestic life curator. And then, um, and then William Clay Ford, Henry Ford's grandson, he was the chairman of the board of the museum at the time. He gave some money to start... Uh, a design history unit, or I don't know what you call it, section, position, mm -hmm. I guess maybe is the best word. Uh, and, um, and so I, I took that and tried to put together a collecting plan for, um, for uh, industrial design history. Uh, William Clay Ford's great interest was in auto design. Mm. I mean, he was involved in aspect, many aspects of the company, but 
that was kind of a, apparently a passion of his. And that's why he funded this position. Um, but the administration of the museum kind of lost interest. And I was kind of felt like I was just kind of floating out there. Yeah, making a paycheck, but not making any difference. Yeah, exactly. And, and so then um, there was a massive, reorg well, there were many reorganizations at Henry Ford Museum in Griffith Village at the time. It was sort of the, uh, you know, the biannual shift mm -hmm. of musical chairs. Um, and, um, uh, but there was an enormous reorganization and, and um, I uh, asked to be um, put in charge of the, of the program activities. So I got kind of got out of the curatorial business and uh, program activities and, and they allowed me to do that. And uh, so we, <clears throat> so my, my focus then was actually on kind of restructuring staff to make uh, my, what I tried to do was to, to get the interpretive staff, um, which included a, a lot of demonstrations, mm -hmm. uh, living history, we had a farm. Um, <laughs> Uh, Perfect. I mean, we had all kinds of, boy. yeah, exactly. We had all kinds of craft shops, we had a railroad, right. you know, model T rides, right. um, you and know, you're all, all kinds of stuff going on. And I'm, yeah. yeah. So yeah, they, my friends called me the mayor of Greenfield village <laughs> 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 and I enjoy, I enjoyed that very much, but the, my goal there was to, uh, you know, it was very not curatorial. It was very managerial. It was basically taking interpretive staff and, and giving them, uh, both the means and the authority to really be creative in their roles mm -hmm. and not just kind of stand there and mouth a, you know, upset, right. you know, spiel, uh, but to, but to really kind of use their backgrounds, their knowledge and, and really develop interesting, active history programs. Yeah, you're managing them. Yeah. And well, managing yeah. them. And, and so and did that open a lane for you and thought, Hey, maybe I can do this at other places, maybe become a yeah. museum director. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it did. Right. And, but at, eventually, um, you know, as much as I loved Henry Ford uh, and Greenfield Village, and now called, as I say, the Henry Ford, which I can't get used to, um, uh, I just burned out on southeastern Michigan. Mm -hmm. it, um, what was it about southeast Michigan? Well, kind of all of it. <laughs> okay. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, the politics, the racial politics were ugly yeah. at the time. Uh, maybe they still are. I don't know. Um, the weather is lousy. It's physically not an attractive place. Mm -hmm. um, it's some very interesting history, but basically I wanted to do something else. And I became enamored of the West and I started taking vacations in the West. And, and you're I, in your mid thirties. So point? I'm yeah. Late thirties. Yeah. So, um, one year I, I remember this very, very vividly. I had, I had done a, just kind of a driving vacation, sort of aimless through, you know, Montana, Wyoming, the Dakotas, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and got back, you know, to work and was sitting there the first day back at work after my vacation thinking about, okay, where am I going to go next year? <laughs> That's a very bad sign. It's a very bad sign. And, and then it dawned on me, I said, just move there. Yeah. <laughs> I could see it taking you a while yeah. to, to make that decision, knowing you. Well, yeah, it's, you yeah. know, right. I'm going to think it out. You're going very, to, exactly. You're very much and so that. I, you know, and I worked there for another year or two, I guess. <laughs> so even then you kept going working yeah. until you finally said, exactly. okay, I've got to get right. out of here. I got to get out of here. And so, so what, what did you do? So I started applying for jobs all over the West. And I, I was, my father was actually born in Montana, near mm. Shoto, Montana, uh, because his father and, and his father's brothers uh, homesteaded there. Uh, I think starting in 1909, my father was born there in 21, mm -hmm. but he grew up in Chicago. Um, and, uh, so I was always kind of fascinated, you know, with that yeah. part of the country and, and spent some time roaming around there. I thought, Oh, you know, let's see if I can get something out there. Well, there are so few museums in that part of the country, right. you know, Wyoming, Montana, um, that I just, you know, so I just started applying everywhere. Realizing you're going to have to know something about Western art, probably or native American art. No, or you didn't. No, know I that. didn't you really. Didn't I, I didn't really care at that point. Yeah. I figure I'll learn what I need to learn. But the I, if I get a management job, right? Because you know, I was looking for a museum director, assistant director, something like yeah. that. You know, um, you know, there will be. I assume there would be subject specialists. Mm -hmm. Well, most Western museums are really small, so yeah. <laughs> they may or may not have subject uh -huh. specialists. But, but um, yeah. So and I, 
I applied for this job in Wickenburg uh, at Desert Caballeros Western Museum. Mm -hmm. Cumbersome name, but a, yeah. a very cool little place. Um, nice collections, um, nice people. And um, decided, yeah, I, I want to do this. Something completely different from anything I'd ever experienced in every way. I mean, I had never set foot in Arizona before I went for the interview. Uh -huh. And how was the interview? Interview was great. I just hit it off with people. Yeah, that doesn't I, surprise I me. I thought it was a wonderful little town. Um, the desert was just just blew my mind. I just I just yeah. kept kind of you know, drive along and all right. the ground is all bare. There's yeah. no, there's <laughs> nothing between the bushes. It's and it's warm. <laughs> it's, yeah, I was there. I don't even remember what time of the year. It must have been. Yeah, it was in the winter. Yeah. So the weather was really nice. Yeah, I think it was like February. And, or and March. had they already lost their museum director, or were they? Yeah. 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 So they were rudderless kind of at that yeah, moment? Yeah, exactly. And right. so did, how long did it take them to offer you the position? Do you know? It, it took, it, they offered me the position before I left town oh, after the interview. Nice. But it, it took me, I kind of, as I recall, I, I, I sort of pushed them to the max. And it took me a while to decide. It just, you know, the attraction was that it was so different. You know, part of the attraction was that it was so different. And part of the terror of <laughs> doing right. it was that it was so different right you know so right uh and but you, eventually yeah i told them yeah i'm gonna come out and i packed up my car and my little ford escort and uh you had a ford escort you didn't have that other car you had for so many years that was the escort oh okay the okay. one you do when i worked for you that little yeah. green car that oh, was, that was the an one. escort yeah you had for a little escort yeah <laughs> 30 racked years up, racked up 299,000 miles on the car. Yeah, this car. I mean, you work, how many years do you work for me? 15 years, maybe? 12 years? Uh, 13. 13. Uh, including the three summers. Yeah. And you always had that car. And every year I was like, you need to get a new car. I would say, pay me more. <laughs> and I said, I'm paying you above everyone else, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I was. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's part of, I don't know, my, my Dutch Middle West upbringing. Yeah. That. If it still works... You got to keep it. Yeah, no, I, I you respect know. you for that, actually. So you go to Wickenburg. You don't have any um, social or romantic connections that you have to bring or make a decision nope. at that nope. point. So you say, okay, I'm just going to so go I'm do just, my thing. I and can just go do what I want to do. And, <laughs> and be in a very small, very conservative town, too. Extremely right? conservative right. town. Yeah. yeah. How did that fit with your mores and all the things? Well, like? um, uh, you know, probably younger people would dis would disapprove and probably not understand it, but, um, you know, I'm of a generation that you could slide kind of in and out of the closet as necessary. All right. And, um, so when I was, uh, when I was at Henry Ford, um, uh, you know, very liberal management, um, my friends there, my colleagues were very accepting. And so I could be out that was not a. It know, wasn't a problem. What about for your? All. Yeah. What about for the people at the museum? Did they know or care about that? You mean the visitors or the no. my colleague, my yeah, work your, colleagues? Your work colleagues. No, they didn't care. Yeah, that's beautiful. No, they didn't okay. care. So you could just do your thing. It was fine. Mm -hmm. and they said, "Ah, oh, he's a museum director," and basically. Uh, Oh, no, maybe I'm not following you. No, Henry Ford, you're talking no, about. No, I'm talking about oh, no, Wickenburg. At, oh, you're talking about Wickenburg. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't, uh, I was not out <laughs> at all at Wickenburg. Uh, because I didn't, I didn't know the territory, you know. I sure, didn't, no, I, I didn't know that. the people. I, I, like I said, I hit it off with the people that were really nice. And, um, but I, you know, it, I didn't understand completely what the situation was. So I figured, oh, I'm just not going to talk about it. Yeah. And I didn't have a partner, so um, yeah. I didn't need to talk about right. it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you focused on learning yeah, about on, Western art. Exactly. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so the whole time I was there um, until the very end, I, I came out to some close friends there. Yes. They basically said, well, why did it take you so long to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> we knew. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody did. Yeah. <laughs> everybody who, who thinks about it. Yeah. And knows know. you. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm always amazed by, by uh, people who don't figure it out, but. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. It's yeah. No, I understand. different topic. I didn't know or didn't care. So yeah, I know you, you were always incredibly cool. With yeah. It. Yeah. It didn't matter. You, I, I was looking no, at very the, supportive. So I always do. I look at the person and see what right. kind of a person you yes. are. And you were clearly a, a, a star in what you were doing. I remember vividly all the shows you were doing and your interest in art. How did you learn that about the Western field? Cause you really caught onto it quite quickly. 
Yeah, and and I really enjoyed it. I mean, the, through my whole career, the you know maybe the reason I kind of kept changing jobs, even within like Henry Ford, kept changing jobs, is that I was kind of always learning about new stuff. Right, and that's always what kind of pulled me along. Um, opportunity to learn about something I you know, didn't feel like you know. When I lived in Washington D.C., I happened across a uh, uh, a little shop that sold Japanese stuff, you mm-hmm. know, woodblock prints and textiles and stuff and I just became fascinated with it so I just sort of learned about Japanese woodblock prints right which I still absolutely love and it's so so anyway um, yeah so I, I of course just did the reading you know and the mm-hmm. muse- the museum had a fairly decent library um, so I was able to 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 do some basic reading what year was but this the, that you came in so it was 97 yeah that okay. I moved to, to Wickenburg um, and but but then there were there were still a few good galleries um, uh, with older Western stuff mm-hmm. uh, left in Scottsdale and of course you guys in Tucson and so I learned a huge amount just by going to the galleries mm. and particularly um, became friends with Abe Hayes in Scottsdale and he really kind of took me under his wing and taught me about about Western art and about art in general yeah that's cool um, he was a very important mentor to me in, in that in that regard. Yeah. And so that meant you got to learn about Maynard Dixon. Exactly. How funny <laughs> how funny is you work with Abe and then you end up with me. Exactly. <laughs> no, and I, I remember sitting in that uh, or you've been in there, there was kind of the big front room and then there was a smaller middle room right. where he had comfortable chairs and right. so on. And I remember it just being lined with little Dixons. Yeah. Um yeah. No we, and so he was he was great. He was very, very good to me. And um and eventually, he he loaned us at, at Desert Caballeros his gear collection. Mm-hmm. Because beside art, he was a big collector of cowboy gear. Right. And so we had that exhibit was up. I don't know for probably ten years mm. at least. Wow. Um, yeah, long after I left. Um, so he was he was very generous with me personally and with the museum. And that collection's too. now at the Western Spirit Museum. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. He gave, he gave all that to me. Yeah. And so. How long did you stay at Wickenburg? Six years. Uh, six years. And so, what made you not go in that same direction? Because you were, you know, you were successful. People liked you. You could have maybe shot for a bigger museum. Yeah, I came in. Uh, I came in second uh, director of the uh, C.M. Russell Museum. Mm-hmm. It's just before I left Wickenburg, and. Um, and then the person they chose, I was, you know, obviously I was kind of disappointed. Sure. Uh, and then, I don't know, six months later or something, I got a call from the headhunter. Yeah. And she said, oh, the person they chose didn't work out. Do you want the job? And I had totally soured on it by that point. And in fact, I'd soured on the museum business in general by that point. I was just burned out with it. Yeah, what was it that burned you out? Bored. You were bored. No. Oh, the B O A R D. Got it. <laughs> Either one could have done it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I wasn't bored at all. I was having, a, I really was having a good time. But um, again, you know, it's the that, politics. I, it's the politics. I just, yeah. whatever it is, my, I do not have the personality to, to deal with that effectively. Right. Um, and uh, uh, so the, the, basically there were a lot of very well-intentioned, very intelligent people who had, little or no experience in how museums operate. Mm. And I had spent my life in museums and had studied it and knew the standards and, you know. How you do things. <clears throat> how you do things, yeah, the processes. And, um, and uh, they just did not respect that background. Yeah. And they didn't mistreat me, but they just, it was as if I was just, another guy off the street right and this is what we want to do and mm-hmm. so we're going to do what we want to do right. and it doesn't matter what your professional background tells you you should do right so you make that decision now i remember at that time you were considering becoming a landscape architect i was actually yeah, yeah I, was, you, I was considering going back to school actually. yeah i remember it all and yeah and i uh, i had made friends with john douglas um a well-known landscape architect yes, in phoenix and so. um and he was encouraging me to do that. And in the end, I decided that I, 
it was better as a hobby. Yeah, and it took a while too because I remember when you came to you came to one of my shows. It was a an opening, and you made the statement, um, "I'm going to. I think I'm going to be leaving the museum field." And I just immediately, and we had just lost our director, or what, or were losing our director. I think in Santa Fe, or I can't remember exactly. I think he'd he'd already gone, and I had just said, "Would you consider this?" Do you remember this conversation? I do. Yeah, go. You tell it. You probably can tell it. I'd like to hear it from your <clears throat> point of view. Well, it's it's um, it's one of those things that's actually uh, some people call it spooky, but I think it's just a really interesting coincidence. Um, so I was I was down there. Um, I remember the, actually where museum. we were sitting in yeah. the, in no, the I place do too. when it happened. Yeah, I do too. Um, and uh, I had I had gone down to Tucson that weekend because. Um, because my sister and her husband were there for uh, some kind of medical meeting. And so I drove down and basically spent the weekend with them. And I remember going in and, and, um, and talking to you and saying, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking for other stuff to do. And, right. you know, and if you have, you know, if you want me to put together a show or write a catalog or something, you know, if you're working on something I can right. help you with, let me know. And you said, basically, come back tomorrow. And I did. Well, <clears throat> that evening, before I came back in the morning, um, I was having dinner with my sister and brother-in-law, and we were talking about, oh, you know, what does Michael want to do? Uh, and <laughs> I wasn't, you know, very serious about the landscape thing at that point, but I wasn't totally sure. And, um, and so my brother-in-law says, well, Michael, let's not talk about what you want to do. Let's talk about where you want to be. And I pretty much immediately said, if I could live in any one place, I would choose to live in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sort of whatever happened, you know, conversation went on from there. Didn't think much more about it until the next day you said, how would you like to run my Santa Fe gallery? <laughs> Oh my! <laughs> yeah. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? <laughs> that is an interesting coincidence. <laughs> I don't know if I ever told you that story. Uh -uh, no, no, uh -uh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it was meant to be, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. it seemed like it. So yeah, and you made a decision fast for you. Yeah, I think I think I asked you to give me a day. Yeah, and I went back talked with my sister, who's sort of my my main confidant, uh -huh. and my brother in law, and they said, "Yeah, go for it." Yeah, and I that, uh, but it's totally what I felt anyway. I was delighted to move to Santa Fe. Yeah. And work for us, I hope. Absolutely. <laughs> and that. No, and it's, um, you know, I'll, I'll flatter you a little bit in saying that, um, you know, I had just enough experience with dealers in my museum career mm -hmm. to know that you have to be really, really careful. Yeah. And I had no hesitation taking a job with you because I know... I knew you would not ask me to do anything that was unethical. Yeah, that's true. I never would. Anybody, including yeah. myself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And no. so, in fact, I think we probably spelled that out right from the beginning. Yeah, I probably did. Yeah. <laughs> we um, don't do any of these other yeah. things. And, and I've told many people that over the years that, yeah. you know, um, because in the museum business, if, if you go into the trade, you're sort of seen as a trader. <laughs> no, it's true. Right. Yeah. I'm sure that was a big, yeah. you know, component because yeah. you knew you were burning those boats when you took the yeah, job. Yeah, kind, kind of. But, you know, when I moved to, even though I, I later applied for the job at Sam Russell Museum, um, when I moved to Wickenburg, I was so burned out on museum stuff that I told myself, I'm going to give this one more shot as a museum director and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. and, but this is my last museum job. I don't know. It, maybe I'll stay there until I die. Right. <laughs> um, or maybe I'll be there six months and gone and then find something else. But this is my last museum job. Yeah. And it's kind of turned out that way. Yeah. Oh. Um, even though now I spend way too much time as a volunteer at the New Mexico History Museum. So I've got, <laughs> kind of got my fingers back in it a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Um, and you're enjoying it? I Very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah lucky to have much. you. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, you know, that was, so it was, it was relatively easy in that regard too to say, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm done with museums. Let's try right. something else. And, um, and again, it was a, it was an opportunity to, to learn something new. And because I didn't know the native material mm -hmm. when I started working for you. Right. So you you're, you're the one who taught me that. Oh, I see. 
Right? Yeah. I mean, we had a little bit at Wickenburg. Yeah. Um, you know, some, we had a broken Maria <laughs> and, and a few other little things there, but it was right. not at all, uh, an important collection at that right. museum. Well, and, you were a quick study. That's for sure. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I learned a huge amount. Um, but also the other thing that, that was fascinating to me. So first time at it. So when did I start? 2003. Sounds so, about right. So I was in my late forties mm -hmm. and, uh, and, um, I had never worked in a for-profit organization yes. before. Yeah. And that was a real eye opener. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now I'm very intolerant of museum people who tend to be, take their time about doing things. <laughs> there's no sense of immediacy. Yeah. You know, even though they're very, very, very busy, there's still no sense of immediacy. Like you gotta, you know, right. Answer this letter now, right. Pick up the phone now, right. Do this transaction right. now yeah make the sale make the sale right yeah. it's yeah i would assume it, the sales part might have been the hardest part for you to definitely to, to deal with because that's so not what you've ever done exactly yeah. no and and I, <laughs> I was just somebody was asking me about this the other day um somebody asked me uh, did you work on commission and i said no i said i said i was really fortunate that mark gave me the option to have a kind of a base salary plus commission or a higher salary without right. commission. Right. And I chose the latter. And my friend said, Oh, well, why'd you do that? And I said, well, I'm very glad I did. And, but the reason, cause it worked out for me, but the reason I did was that, um, I had no idea if I could sell anything or sure. not. Sure. Right. And I think it works better than that's how we've done our business. Yeah. Really, I, I know just, in the sub, in the subsequent years, you've pretty much, yeah, we just said, you don't do commission. No, anymore. Commission. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I want to work as a team, have our mm -hmm. people work as right. a team. Everybody's working on the yeah, same and side. No one yeah. tries to grab this right. or that exactly. or cares right. about it. They want to just do, make sure the gallery does well as a whole. If yeah. they, if they exactly. do well, we all do well. Right. And, uh, and it also, I think it did, it takes the pressure off you of sales. Now, a lot of people, a lot of gallerists, I think would like to have that because it makes them want to push and yeah, but exactly. That's never been but my. It's not way your to, style of, uh -uh, of selling. Like, no, I don't I like mean, that. You, I always, you know, tell people, Mark will talk you to death, but yeah. he won't. <laughs> but he won't ever pressure you no. to buy anything. Uh -uh. And so I was very grateful for that because that is not my personality at all yeah, is to no, pressure somebody. Wasn't. But the you know, uh, the style at Medicine Man Gallery is to tell people why this why the stuff is beautiful and cool and interesting right. and important and That's right. historic and whatever and. You know, if, if that doesn't do it for them, well, then, you know, yeah. let's, let's move on to the next customer. Yeah. Well, it's true. There's nothing worse, I think, than having somebody buy something, they take it home and go, God, I wish I hadn't bought that. It was like an impulse yeah, thing. exactly. I'd much rather them go, oh, that was so wonderful. I'm going to want to get more. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of antithetical to how I yeah. think most and, uh, sales places work. But. Yeah. And I, I, I hate being hounded by salespeople. Yeah. When I personally go into a shop or a gallery, yeah. I just want to look around for a few minutes and I might have a question for you. And then, you know, I would like you to be available to engage. <laughs> right. But, but basically I, I got, I remember I went to a show once on Canyon road and young inexperienced salesperson. She literally followed me from painting to painting <laughs> to painting and tried to start a conversation. Right. And I kept saying, oh, I just like to look for a minute. Right. And she just kept at it. And, after about five minutes of that, I just left. I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, no. and so that I mean that's <laughs> that's the extreme version of it. But but the the interest, you know, again, you know, sort of learn learn something new all the time. And one of the things learning is is kind of to try to read people yes. and what they want because some people really want to be engaged. Yes, and some people just want to be left alone and kind of everything in between. Um, but the the most fun part, the part that was the most satisfying about retail is when people were genuinely interested and had good questions and they really wanted to learn. Yeah. And that is really fun. Yeah. And sometimes it results in a sale and sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, my thought was that, okay, if, if I'm not selling them something today, if they had a good experience with me, they'll be back. Yeah, that's right. They will, or say something positive mm -hmm. about that gala. You should go exactly. there. It was really interesting. Right. I learned something. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's never stopped. That won't so, ever. That won't ever stop while right. I'm at the helm. I hope. Yeah. So that um, that was <clears throat> that was always the kind of the payoff, right, for the tedium of retail. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing you got to do, which was you got to, because you still always had this wonderful interest in landscape architecture. You got to do all I got the, to gardens do the gardens. The gardens, right? The yeah, that was by a the lot way, of fun. I went by and saw them. 
they are looking fantastic. That's what Kathleen oh said. my goodness yeah, gracious. Good. I'm glad. In fact, my first word is, oh, Michael would be so excited. <laughs> I, got her, I got her to sneak back there sometime. Oh, no, and see they really are beautiful. So Michael did all our <laughs> gardens in our Canyon Road, 602 Canyon Road gallery, and they were just fantastic. Everybody, People would come in, in fact, for the gardens, forget the art. They just <laughs> they go right through the gallery, boop, right to the back. <laughs> and, and the building at 602. Yeah, the building yeah, beautiful. People. I had people come in and say, I just want to look at the building. Yeah. Um, so we got to that point, and we ended up deciding we were going to sell our buildings, which we did. And so we, you had to do something. And I always knew there was a lane for you that was just sitting there perfectly for you, which was in the appraisal business. But did you see that as a... I, I knew you would succeed. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I didn't... I had thought of it um, because... Yeah, uh, you know, we we knew Scott. I got to know Scott and Cynthia in the last few years. I worked well, mm -hmm. at the gallery, um, and, and I knew a couple other appraisers, but not very well. Um, and so I, it it occurred to me, but I didn't really think of it seriously to tell you the truth until you, until you encouraged me to think about yeah. it. And then I started exploring really what it meant because I didn't, you know, like most people, right. I, I didn't really understand what was involved, um, even though, you know. We would value stuff in the museum all the time, but I right. knew that's got to be different from what an appraiser does, mm -hmm. independent of a gallery. Um, so, so then I thought, yeah, this this makes total sense, and it it's because to be an appraiser, you have to know the material, and you have to know the markets for the material, mm -hmm. and those are different things. Very different. But I was a curator, and I know the material, and I worked in retail for thirteen years, so I know the markets. Right. And, so and you're meticulous. It, and yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Very meticulous. <laughs> and you write well. And yeah, and um, well, that, we should talk about Canyon Road Arts too, because yeah. that was a, also a, a episode that I really, really enjoyed. Oh yeah. But uh, but anyway, so yeah, so I mean, so I realized that yeah, you were right. I was totally. It was I was perfectly aligned yeah. to become an appraiser, and it wasn't difficult for me for those reasons. No. To, and you don't have to yeah. show up at 9.30 a.m. either. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, was telling a friend the other day that, you know, I um, I still keep retail hours, even though I work at home. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't surprise just, me. Yeah, all. I mean, I just got into this rhythm, you know, of of being, of, of kind of working 10 to 5 and working through lunch. Well, I work, now I work 9 to 5 and work through lunch, but mm -hmm. basically I just keep bankers hours, which is great. Yeah, and what so tell people because they may want to because we have lots of people listening to that who need appraisals. What kind mm -hmm. of things do you appraise? So I appraise Southwest Native material, old and new, and uh, American Western fine art, so paintings, prints, sculpture, and um, and then American decorative arts. Although there's not as much call for that out mm -hmm. here as there as there probably would be in big cities or back east. Mm -hmm. Um, so American and some European furniture, silver ceramics. Mm -hmm. What about Hispanic material? Um, I know you know the furniture. Yeah, I know the furniture, but I don't, I, I will typically, I'll, I'll do Hispanic material generally if it's part of a collection. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will either ask for help or I'll simply turn over the appraisal to another appraiser who has more experience than I do. Right. And so when somebody comes to you and goes, oh, I want to get an appraisal, how, and how do you figure out what to charge? Is it by an hour basis, by a per piece basis? How does that function? Yeah, well, um, it, generally by the hour. Um, you might also, and, and people with large collections will sometimes put it out to bid. Mm -hmm. So you give them a flat fee. Um, but, um, but we are prohibited in uh, the old practice of charging based on the value of the material, yeah. which obviously is a conflict of interest. Yeah. Do people still do that out there? Uh, uh, not anybody who uh, <laughs> follows the ethical rules of their, right. the appraiser organization they belong to. Right. So the, um, just a little background on, on, on how that's structured. So the um, personal property appraisers basically follow the same rules that real estate appraisers do, mm -hmm. although real estate appraising is somewhat more complicated, typically. Um, and there are three large organizations in the United States to which um, uh, personal property appraisers can belong and which provide the education and the certifications. Mm -hmm. And so if you, and you can join all three if you want. I, I belong to the International Society of Appraisers, which specializes in personal property. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
if you say you are credentialed by the International Society of Appraisers, your appraisers follow the, the procedures that they outline uh, for how you do an appraisal and how you report it. And those are two slightly different mm -hmm. things. But you also have to follow the ethical guidelines. And, and there's no, you know, they're, they're strict about those things. Yeah, they should be. <laughs> and yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so typically, um, if I, if I, an appraisal job is called an assignment. So if somebody calls me asking, you know, if I can appraise X, Y, Z, um, I, I tell them my hourly rate and I usually charge by the hour and, um, and uh, I try to estimate, you know, what it's going to take based on what the material is mm -hmm. and try to figure out, okay, this, you know, there, this is something where there's going to be lots of comparable sales or offers readily available. So it won't take very long to put right. that together or something that needs a lot more research is obscure. I got to do a lot of digging, um, got to go into markets that I, you know, that where, where the information like, you know, uh, it's easy to get prices from retail gallery or look at the auction databases. Right. Or go to Medicine Man Gallery. Or go to Medicine right? Man Gallery, right, which I do you know, practically Daily. every day. Yeah. And there are, yeah, there are a bunch of websites. But, sure, right, um, they have prices that yeah, you can use. Exactly. Um, but, you know, sometime, sometimes the market that you need to be looking at is like consignment shops, mm. you know, and so stuff is all over the map there, and it's much harder to find. And the one of the unfortunate... Uh, aspects of doing appraisals is sometimes the, the less valuable stuff requires more time to appraise. Yeah. But you always have to keep a sense of proportion with those things. And right. Realizing and, that you don't want to overcharge exactly. for it because you kind of already have a sense. And if it's a exactly. $200 object, you don't want to so, spend a hundred of it appraising. Precisely. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, um, you still have to base your appraisal on solid information, but you try to gather it in a way that, you know, is the most efficient possible so mm -hmm. that you keep the, the, the appraisal in proportion um, to the material. And do you find your business is busier? I mean, I know you're continuing to grow, so, mm -hmm. but do you see overall a general decrease in the amount of people doing appraisals or more? Well, actually, in Santa Fe, I mean, I don't know in general. I suspect, uh, I suspect the, the business is growing. In Santa Fe, there have been a few new people coming in in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so it can support a robust yeah, number and there's, of appraisers and there's definitely competition, but we all seem to be, you know, busy. So yeah, that's um, good. Yeah. And how do people find you if they wanted to find you? Um, by referrals, but on my website, uh, I, uh, a huge amount of traffic. That's something I learned from you too. <laughs> so, uh, how important a website is. Yeah. Uh, and the right name. Yeah, and exactly. Give, go ahead and give the name out okay, there. Okay. Art Appraisals of Santa Fe, which is. Which is a suggest dot com, which is a suggestion from Mark Sublette, which I thought was a really good suggestion, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think it's paid off. Um, so yeah, artappraisalsofsantafe dot com, uh, and um, I found a really good uh, web designer here in Santa Fe whose rates are really reasonable, and, um, and the website has generated a lot of traffic. Yeah. yeah. And it's Michael Etima, if we never mentioned oh, your yes. name, because we may never <laughs> have, they, had to, they had to wait the whole thing right. to make sure <laughs> to get the name. But I can tell you, you're ethical, you do a fantastic job, you're meticulous, we refer our people to you, we've used you, and um, yeah, go to Michael Etima. So Michael, anything else you want to say? Anything else? Words of wisdom to so those young people who are about to go into the museum <laughs> business, or maybe appraisal <laughs> business, or yeah. sales, you've got all three under your belt. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, the, I, uh, I was approached by um, a guy who'd been a kind of a part-time dealer here in Santa Fe for a while and saying he was interested in, um, in getting his appraisal certifications. And, and uh, so I, I, even though I don't, you know, I consider myself still, um, you know, relatively new. I've been doing this now for five years full-time. Yeah, um, but you've been in the, this business for 30. But I've been in, yeah, it <laughs> actually... Well, just in the Western part. Just in the Western part. I've been in, in the business of dealing with art and artifacts for over 40 years. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is shocking to me. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so, I, I mean, I tried to pass on, um, 
you know, or, or tried to do him the favor that was done to me by Scott Hale and Cynthia Hale and helping me get started, even though, you know, I'm a competitor to, right. to the Hales. Um, they were extremely generous and, yeah. In, in helping me get started, so I wanted to do that for Aaron Richard, um, and uh, and so that's been good. But so I encourage people to you know to explore, you know what it's all about because it it's it can be fascinating. It can be like any job, it can be tedious, but right. but it's it's pretty interesting, and you do get to call your own shots. Uh, as far as as far as words of wisdom for the museum world, my <laughs> niece, my sister's daughter, mm-hmm. is has just. Um, uh, started a her second master's program in American history and, and public history at the University of Eastern Florida. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she, she says, oh, I just want to be like Uncle Michael. I said, well, you know, careful what you wish for. Because <laughs> <laughs> you may have a but, circuitous <laughs> road that you don't realize. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, but no, it's it's been good. I've I've lived in really interesting places and learned a great deal over the years and and have had wonderful people to work with and and so it's you know i never made a lot of money but yeah it's okay that's well, never a, been a priority for yeah, me yeah you have a great house you love santa fe mm-hmm. and i don't see you moving ever no nope, i don't either yeah so <laughs> you're now not the mayor of santa fe yeah. instead <laughs> of the other place <laughs> no no i said somebody somebody mentioned that the other day so oh, you're interested in politics i'm interested in politics but not in running for office yeah. Those are <laughs> you would be good at it actually not. well thank you but <laughs> Oh no, no. That's it's see it's that politics thing again. Yeah, I know. You know? I understand. Policy is one thing. That's great. I can deal with policy, yeah. but the politics, yeah. No, no. Well not so much. Look for Michael. Thank you for taking the time. It's fun to be able to actually sit and talk to you about yeah. this stuff. We yeah. haven't done this in a long time. No, no. Now we'll go have a drink later tonight and we'll find out the real story. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I hated working for you that whole time. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No. So th- thank you for this opportunity yeah. too. I really appreciate it. And you've been very supportive of my business. So Yeah, no. You're a great person. Michael thank Edema, thank you. All right. you. All thank right. you so very much. Good. Michael Edema on the Art Dealer Diaries. Fun as that, huh? That was good. That was fun. Yeah, it is fun. Well, it's fun for me because I already know everything about. Well, I don't know everything about you, but I know enough that. Yeah. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.